Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Vanessa Thomas, and I'm the manager of Explore the Arts, the adult education branch of the Kennedy Center's Education Department. And we are so thrilled to be participating in the Gospel Across America Festival, Joyful Sounds. We're coming down to the end of it, so we're glad that you stuck with us for the long haul. This afternoon, you're here for Harmony and Lead, a gospel vocal style. We will be joined, hopefully shortly, by Mr. J.J. Hairston, who is in traffic. Apparently, it's been bad around, the, around town, so when he comes in, we'll get him up on stage. But now we have Dr. Lloyd Mallory, Jr. He is our moderator for the panel this afternoon. He currently serves as Associate Pastor for Music and Worship at the Sligo Church in Tacoma Park, Maryland. He holds a Doctor of Music Arts degree from UCLA, and he also holds two Master of Arts degrees from Morgan State University in choral conducting and in voice. So please welcome our moderator who will introduce you to our other special guest. Thank you very much, and good afternoon to you. Glad you could come out today. Uh, to my right here, my good friend and mentor, Richard Smallwood, no stranger to some of you, but uh, very renowned in the Washington, D.C. area, a member of the Metropolitan Baptist Church and recording artist. And Richard, I believe you, can you tell us how many songs can you recount that you have written? I have a number in my mind, but I don't want to insult you. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I started writing when I was about uh, 18, so that was a couple of years ago, so I have, <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, well, <laughs> then I would say at least uh, over 100 songs or more, okay. and uh, with the Richard Smallwood singers and with Vision and a recording artist in his own right, and Richard is writing his autobiography and a new CT CD forthcoming, uh, 2010, with the autobiography to follow called Promises. And his autobiography, of course, would be of him and his life and his life's work. And we are happy and excited about that. Richard Smallwood, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. And in route, we have J.J. Hairston, who is a native of Brooklyn, New York, and is the current director of Youthful Praise. They have about three CDs out. And he is renowned for his work that he is doing in the community of Brooklyn as well as with youth and in choral singing of the gospel genre. And so he too will be serving as a facilitator of this event. So J.J. Hairston, and we will pray that uh, traffic will release and he will be able to get here soon. And he also has brought some singers too to participate in this event. But J.J. Hairston is our missing member who will join us right here when he does get here. As I move forward, you have come to experience a wonderful form of music, gospel music. Gospel meaning a story. Gospel music meaning good news. Gospel music meaning an experience. It's life today. It's ongoing. Richard and others can write music every day because of experiences and blessings that they encounter every day. I want you to leave here today knowing what it takes to be a gospel singer because I believe you out there could be a gospel singer. Do you all have some good news to tell? Do you have a story to tell? Do you love God or do you serve a God? If you love God, you've got a story to tell. Do you believe in the Bible? The gospel represents all of that. So the ingredients for that, one must have those components right there. Good news to tell, an experience, a story that they have encountered with God. Gospel music also is biblically based in a healthy way that it takes stories from the Bible. It takes from the Bible personal messages that the writer, the songwriter will portray in lyrics. And then the artist, the singer, they themselves will internalize that. What we want to demonstrate to you today, and we also want to hear your questions in that, and Richard and JJ and myself, we're going to do our best to help you leave, that when you do hear 
a gospel piece on the radio, you can identify that because we also want you to know that just as there is positive, there is also negative. So in that, there's good gospel music, but we also want you to know that there is some not so positive gospel music. So in that, we want to make you aware of that because in that, you will know how to choose, you will know what to listen for, you will know how to uh, expand your appreciation for gospel music. <clears throat> Richard and I are now going to go into demonstration mode, but we thought everybody is familiar with the tune Amazing Grace. Am I not correct? Well, the first thing is, what does it take and what goes into being a gospel singer. Richard, could you help us with that? What does it, what have you discovered in working with singers? What does go into being a gospel singer? Well, um, first of all, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I think there are a number of things that, that play into uh, being what we call a gospel singer. I first, first of all, it has to be a gift. There has to be a gift there, I think. Uh, a musical gift that uh, most people who have it were born with it. Uh, and then there has to be some type of personal experience with God. Uh, uh, in other words, a relationship. So that when I was in undergrad, I had an English teacher um, uh, who taught literature. We had to write essays, and she always said, don't ever write uh, on a subject that you know nothing about. So in other words, if, uh, if you're gonna write an essay about the workings of an automobile and you don't know what a carburetor is, then perhaps you should choose another subject. So it's the same thing with gospel. It, it has to be a personal thing. It has to come from within. And you have to know something about you know, what, what you're singing about. Um, and of course, vocally, um, we'll talk probably a little bit later about improvisation and, and uh, I don't think there's one style of gospel music. We have gospel singers who, who sing in all different styles, but when you, uh, you know, w when you get to the final outcome of it, it's still gospel music. So as I hear you, do not sing a, or write about something you do not know. So tell me, what is your background in music? Well, my background is that, first, first of all, I'm a PK, and those of you who don't know what that is, is a preacher's kid. Um, I started, um, my mother says I started humming uh, melodies that I heard at church before I could talk. So they got me a toy piano, and I began to pick out stuff on the toy piano. By the time I was seven, I was playing for uh, my dad's church. Um, of course, took formal lessons. Uh, when I finished uh, high school, went to Howard University and got my degree in uh, uh, classical piano performance. Um, and, but of course, I came up listening to everything I came up listening to. I came up in the Motown era, some of y'all remember Motown. So I, you know, I, I was influenced by Motown, I was influenced by the traditional gospel artists of that time, Clara Ward, Roberta Martin, the Davis sisters, uh, James Cleveland, uh, Albertina Walker, all of those, you know, played in, uh, had an effect on, 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 on who I was to become in terms of my style. I think when I began to write, all of those different genres began to have an effect, the classical, the pop, the, you know, traditional um, um, gospel as well. So then you having a music background and then further, uh, being educated and trained classically as a musician, how has that impacted your ministry as a gospel artist, uh, as a gospel um, songwriter, composer, uh, conductor, and director in your own right? How have, has that education impacted you? Because you did say that is important for us to work in our giftedness. And so I do want you as an audience to know that there are people that are gifted whether they have gone to school or not, that can be a yeah. gospel singer. So I wanna make that clear first. But also that in this, you have taken it past a point and been educated. And so how, that, how has that impacted you? Because I can tell how that has impacted me. And I'm gonna come out there and ask you how has it impacted you? But how has that influenced and impacted your ministry? Well, um, it just made me different. <laughs> 
uh, than everyone else, I guess, in terms of my style. It really, the classical thing really didn't start with the education. My mother, when I was about seven years old, my mother brought me home a, re a recording of Rachmaninoff's Piano Concerto Number no. 2, seven-year-old, and said, listen to this. If you like it, I'll take you to some classical concerts. So that's where the love of classical you know, music began, even before the educational part came. But I think there's an old adage that's saying, you know, you are what you eat. And I, I took in all of those different types of music, and when I began to write, then the classical and, and all, all of that became, began to come out. And I don't think too many other people were doing that. I was chastised by the record companies saying that, take that classical mess out of there, and, and you know, it's not commercial, and you'll never make it, and you, you can't write. And I got my feelings hurt a lot of times, but I knew that whatever God had given me, he had given me for a reason, and I was just gonna keep pressing on until I reached whatever it was that uh, he had preordained for me. Another question that comes to mind, how are you inspired in your writing? You said that you took a lot of criticism and a, and a lot of negativity came at you because of what you had experienced. And in those experiences, you poured that out into your music. So tell us, for those that are out there that perhaps are like you, that are teetering with uh, gospel music or writing or songwriting, how does one encroach that? begin that in terms of experiences in terms experience? of writing in terms of just give us a simple thing of an experience that you've had in writing a song how does that start how does that germinate well for me uh it usually has a lot to do with what i experience in my life uh whether it's personally whether it's family um those types of things tend to uh start a song um the last, my mom died four years ago, which was like really traumatic to me because I'm an only kid. So um, the songs that came out of that and other uh, difficult situations, I've been through, sometimes draw from that experience. I'm working on a new song called um, If You Sow in Tears, You'll Reap in Joy, which, is, which comes from a scripture that talks about um, um, sowing and, and reaping what you sow. But if you sow in tears, then you reap in joy, which means that uh, uh, the crying will be temporarily, temporary, but uh, the joy will be coming and be following. So peace will be coming uh, following the tears. So those kinds of things um, always affect me, um, even when I'm not thinking about it. And sometimes when I write and I look and I listen after I finish writing, I can connect where that came from. You know, so I think my experiences, more than anything else, probably have a lot to do with what I write and how I write. Would you articulate what you hear in your mind, what you envision? Because we're getting to why you have come. What are the components in singing gospel music? So as you are composing something or you're hearing something, because I know as a conductor myself, we're trained to hear that music before it actually comes to fruition or before it actually is taking place. I look at a score and I am trained to look at it and in my mind picture, how is this going to come? What does this look like? What does, is this is going to sound like? As you compose, as you songwrite and write, what is your expectation on what do you, because you have in your mind a soloist or a singer must have certain things in order to capture what it is that you have been inspired to pen? Well, um, I, th I think I write in, in several different ways. Um, the first one is that voices inspire me. I, I am a fanatic over the human voice and what it's capable of. Uh, and when there is a voice that, that I enjoy, that I like, that I favor, um, sometimes I can hear that person singing uh, a certain song and that'll just start to develop in my mind. It may start off as a, um, a measure uh, or just an idea uh, and then I'll develop it from there, keeping their range and um, the, uh, the power of their voice in mind and, and what works for them and what doesn't. You know, you have to know uh, the good parts of your voice and the bad parts, you know, and, and, and what to shy away from. And so knowing that, that always helps me in terms of my writing. A lot of songs I also dream, um, so uh, it, it, it comes in various ways. 
various ways. I am going to involve you now, and Richard, I think I'm going to need you at the piano, and I'm going to go over here to this microphone. But audience, can you hear me now? Yes, you can hear me now. Audience, if you would, um, I want to give you a demonstration, and you're going to be a part of that demonstration. What does it take, and what goes into singing gospel music? Um, I asked you earlier how many are familiar with the tune Amazing Grace, and I think a lot of you are. I think, Richard, if we did it in G major, that's a safe key. And I would like you just to sing with me, Amazing Grace. We're going to just sing like if we were in church, just a straight version of it. Here we go. singing with me and amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now is it not? Now I'm going to ask Richard if he would just give us a gospel accompaniment to that and I'm going to ask you to sing that with me again. I don't want you to change anything that you've done but we're going to just ask for a gospel accompaniment and we're already in the making of gospel. So here we go. If you give me a lead in. And Amen. can do and what I cannot do but just in that you have felt something even in just the difference of that accompaniment versus the first accompaniment because the first accompaniment the melody duetted so with the second time that you heard it with that accompaniment it needs a little bit more you just can't sing it that straight just like we just did just like I just did so Richard, in your own way, if that mic is now working, Shake I would one. like you now to just demonstrate your own interpretation, and then I might need a volunteer out there to, to, to come up here. If I've got a volunteer of someone that could bring this to life, because gospel music is somewhat spontaneous from your own heart as to what you feel, what you want to do, what inspires you to do, and it's a connection with uh, a, a spirit, a Holy Spirit, we call it, that is leading you as you go. You're a minister, you're a preacher in song. So the gospel music becomes a sermon in song. It's not just words that you're detached from, but you are now bringing that forth based on your experience, based on your ability. So Richard, you're in your own key, in your own way. Would you listen to this third variation, Amazing Grace, Richard Smallwood. Amazing Grace, how 
how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I volunteer out here. I, I, I would like to meet some right here. Do we have a, a volunteer in our audience that would just Somebody's like to come? Somebody being volunteered. Someone being <laughs> volunteered. We want a volunteer. Come, my friend. Come quickly, sir. <laughs> would you give us your name and where you're from real quick? Here, talk to the mic. Um, my name is Derek Branch. I'm from Manassas, Virginia. I'm in college. Uh, music. Studying music. Vocal performance or Vocal piano? Performance. Vocal performance. Vocal. Are you a tenor or a baritone? A tenor. You're a tenor, so we can keep them right there. We're in A flat, so is that a comfortable key for you? Mm -hmm. All right. That takes courage, my friends, to come up and just do something like that off the cuff. We want to thank you, my friend. I am wondering, do you all have any questions out there? And we have some mics that are going to be floating around that we might take some questions from you that you can pose to either Mr. Smallwood or myself uh, as to what you have just experienced and also any questions that you might have um, about the singing of gospel music. Are, do we have those mics that are, are circulating there? Does, just ask from the audience. Okay, if you would just stand and talk very clearly and use your baseball voice, <laughs> football voice. Does anyone have a question out there? I know you do. You want to know how to do that? Um, if there's some sort of, of a basis or process that goes through to change it from being a major third into a, a minor third that just makes that perfect fit for that thing, for that sound. 
Um, I, th I think one of the things is that uh, th there's a certain formula that a lot of hymns have in terms of the harmonic progression. Uh, and um, gospel, I think, sometimes is a little more free, uh, a little more uh, improvisatory, if you will. Say, if you, if you did, let me think of a song. Um, uh, say, Jesus loves me. So like the hymn would go, Jesus Basically just to the one and the four, and to the five. Now, if I was teaching it to a gospel choir, per se, uh, I might change the harmony, uh, not only with the voices, but with the complement as well to something like this. Uh, diminished chords, the secondary dominance, secondary dominance, the sevens, diminish, maybe to the six, another secondary dominant, the dominant. So, um, one thing you have to know is I think you have to listen a lot to gospel music and understand what I call the gospel chord vocabulary uh, because there's certain things that are peculiar to gospel that we can't really go into right now in terms of harmony and in, in terms of even accompaniment, but you'll hear it in, in just about any gospel piece, any good gospel piece that you, that you listen to. So I remember when I was coming up, the way I learned how to teach uh, gospel choirs and the way I learned how to play was listen to recordings over and over and over again and try to emulate some of the things that I heard until finally those things just began to take root and I just sort of knew instinctively when I got ready to talk, uh, got ready to teach exactly where to go. I was thinking the same thing, a vocabulary, just like we have a speaking vocabulary, there is a music vocabulary for each genre and those that are classical connoisseurs if you come to hear the Verdi Requiem, sometimes you will bring your score. Even better, the Messiah. Everybody hears Handel's Messiah and sings it every season. In that, there is a stylistic practice, a Handelian style, a Baroque style in how we approach singing the Messiah. And oftentimes, depending on the conductor and what their preferences are, most of them have a desire that you sing in this particular style, such is the case with gospel. And I'm hoping I'm answering your question along with what Mr. Smallwood has said, that in that vocabulary, as you listen to more gospel music, you'll pick up those chord progressions that are used. Also, you should know that gospel is evolving as well because uh, you can back me up too, Richard, that as gospels began, not all of the singers necessarily had degrees or were trained in the music area, but they felt a calling and a desire to sing. They were pastor's kids like Mr. Smallwood, but today we have more prolific writing taking place as a result of the education that these artists have received. Thus, the singing is changing. Thus, the writing of the music is also evolving. So in that, you have a time now line of gospel music that can go from its beginnings now to uh, what is current today, just like we do in music, to go from Baroque to the modern music. And most of us don't listen to a whole lot of contemporary modern music where they're stomping on the floor and thunk, 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 and you have a sound and all of that kind of thing, that's abstract to us. But that is modern music if you go to the 21st century. So you have, in classical music, this timeline that goes from here to here, but you also have the same thing happening in gospel music. And if you begin to reach back as well as to get what is coming today, you will build that vocabulary, and then you get inspired uh, 
to recreate that which you have listened to as well. Is there another good question such as that one? Yes, ma'am. I mean, this is the expert right here, but certainly I always say that um, if you're going to sing, whether it's at a, you know, in terms of a pastime or singing in the gospel choir, you should get some vocal training. I think that's so important. And vocal training uh, 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 teaches you how to sing from the diaphragm and how to project and those, those kinds of things that, that you're asking about. So I always say get a voice teacher or a vocal instructor to help you in those problem areas that we all have. As a choral conductor myself, it is my job to protect the voice of the singer. Not all of our conductors do that because they may not have the vocabulary to say what it is that they're really trying to get you to do. And that's not just true for gospel music. I want to make that clear that that's true for classical music. Uh, there are singers that I have trained that have big voices but have been asked to squeeze them into these little tiny box because we want to get this boy choir sound out of them and they are not capable of doing that. There's an age limit and a requirement to get some of those kinds of sounds. So in that, the first thing I would say to you is if you feel anything in your throat, it's wrong. <laughs> Period. The idea, too, with gospel music that is a great joy to a lot of singers is the energy behind it. Your body is your instrument, and your body is constantly producing breath, or it needs to produce breath. If you're not tired, because they say the first thing that if you're tired, you cannot really sing like you need to, and that is important. A singer really cannot sing at his or her best if they are tired. Okay, because you have to generate breath. Your body has to generate that constant flow. And I just call it like a cycle thing where you're just constantly churning that breath because breath is the pitch. So in that gospel music, when you begin clapping and swaying, you're releasing all of that tension that you could have by standing and singing classical music. And we're taught to stand a certain way for classical music because that's classical, and we want that. However, the challenge of being a classical singer is to create that same energy by standing in a classical way, just like those that are doing gospel, clap, sway, and sing. That is not easy to do. I challenge, I'm challenged with that. You get one of the three with me. You, I, you can't have all three. You know, but those that can do that clap sway and sing and then syncopate that thing, they're phenomenal. And there are choirs that you perhaps have heard already, seen already. That is phenomenal to me. So when I look at that, I respect that just like I would a classical artist that can sing to me German Lied or a French song or an operatic aria and just have all of that passion and intensity. So my friend, I would say to you, when they're asking you to give more, if you can conceptualize another question, how do you envision that? Do you want it darker? Do you want it brighter? As opposed to just give me more, is it volume? I would say to you, if you are giving as much volume as you can, then nod and say, okay, I'll give you more and remain because oftentimes it's just you nodding to say, I'm giving you more. And I've had s conductors as a singer ask me, can you give more? I'm like, sure I can. And I'll just stay right where I am because, and to them they're like, that's great. And I didn't do anything different. I just acknowledge, yes, I'm gonna give you some more. So remain healthy vocally like that. As Mr. Small would say, vo said, vocal training is important. I think singing is probably one of the hardest things that you can do because your chords 
are this long and they're thinner than your fingernail and you've got two of them and in that throat space you've got to create pitch and you've got to create pitch that will go in between half steps whole steps and then sing octave leaps and all it's just ridiculous so in that anyone that gets up and sings they deserve applause just like this gentleman came and did for us because it's not easy and so i ch i uh, encourage you all find good vocal teachers because they're around here and they want to help you be a better singer is there another good question I think I see a hand yes can you can you stand please we'll take this young lady here in the center and then you ma'am yes okay is there another good question? Yes. Yes. No, but I'll come closer. Okay. Um, my question is very similar to the knuckle movement. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how the movement has to do with the Did you hear that? Um, what, is she, what is she asking is, how important is to sway or to clap? How does that integrate in the singing of gospel? And how important is it in the singing of gospel? Well, it, it's a part of gospel music, uh, the clapping. I mean, if, if you really want to go back uh, to, uh, to Africa, where we get really tr the tradition from of gospel singing, a lot of the uh, guttural sounds and the falsetto and the things we do that, that came from, from Africa. And of course, rhythm and percussion and drums and clapping was very much a part of that, and dancing. And so even when this tradition of music you know, came over to America and, and the slaves fashioned it into Negro spirituals and then into gospel music and all of that, um, that clapping and that swaying really is a throwback from the foundation of, of, of gospel music and where it came from. So certainly it, it's, it's almost as much a part of it is of, of it as the actual singing, especially when you talk about a choir. Now most soloists don't you know, clap and sway, but when you're talking about a choir, an ensemble, that's very much a part of the presentation and, and, and what they do. I would add too that it's, it looks good when everyone goes that way on cue. Unlike me, <laughs> when, I first, when I first went to Morgan State, I could not sway nor clap. So they actually had to pull my robe right and left be, because I'm like, who does this? I, I know how to do this. And so it is something that you have to learn. So even in the choirs that I have had and the students that come, um, at UCLA, I taught a gospel number, and oh, just the things that I saw, because everybody internalizes rhythm differently from their own background of culture, as well as to what they physically, innately can do. So I then had to just say, Let's, we're not doing any music. We're just going to learn how to go back and forth and, and, and work that a little bit. Then we're gonna talk about how to clap because everybody's got a different clap from a different shake. You know, clap this way, miss, and you miss the beat and all of that. So those kinds of things, you want to make sure that they are choreographed, is that a good way to say it? Or synchronized, synchronized. so that everybody goes that way when it's time and then we go this way and we move that way at the same time and folk are not beating each other so that you get a bang together. You know, uh, you've seen what I'm talking about. You, do, you know what I mean. So in that, that is very important. And I just wanted to further embellish what Mrs. Smallwood said. I believe even other ethnicities and races, Indian race, Asian race, uh, Italian, they also incorporate rhythms from their um, 
background as well, and they have their dances and things that they do, the Jewish tradition, all of that. So all of us come from a different background where movement is a part of that. There's nothing wrong with that as long as we are reverent about it and that we are proper as to when we're going to do what we're going to do so that it does not detract or take from what it is that we are trying to portray and the message is not skewed. We don't want to send a bad message or we do not want to make a bad impact. Is there another good question? Yes. Hi. Well, first of all, the word gospel means the good news, the good news, the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news is just not in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but it's in Genesis, it's in, you know, it's in Deuteronomy, it's in Revelation, it's in all of the, all the Bible. So that's, the, theologically, that's not a good argument in terms of, uh, they're talking about the synoptic gospels, but when we talk about gospel music, we're talking about the good news of Jesus Christ most of the time. So. Um, they can be taken anywhere. I do think, taken from anywhere, I do think that the songs that we sing need to have some kind of biblical base to it. Uh, even the ones that we sort of, uh, which are more testimonies from our personal lives, there still should be some type of biblical foundation for it so that, that we make sure that theologically we're not saying something wrong or or seeing something wrong, but certainly, you know, the gospel in terms of lyrics can come from anywhere in the Bible simply because it's about the good news. Mm -hmm. That was a great question. Is there another great one? I know you've got them out there. Yes, sir. <laughs> you got that one? <laughs> I really, you know, I really don't have the answer to that other than um, the, the, the early gospel groups. There, there were two uh, uh, sects, if you will, of, of gospel uh, uh, groups. There was the male, which was the quartet, um, which usually... It, it was called quartet, but sometimes there were five or six or seven males, but the, the style was called quartet. And then there was the female uh, uh, gospel singers, which basically sang higher. Somewhere in the transition from that whole female thing into the choir, I think those high uh, parts sort of translated. So um, it's sort of peculiar to gospel music that the tenor part is is probably higher than usual, probably higher than classical or, or any other uh, genre of music. What I try to do is, uh, especially if I'm doing workshops, if I'm working with my own group, that's different. I make whatever I say sing, they gotta sing. But when, I, when, I, when I'm working with workshops, I always try to create a baritone part uh, so that those uh, males, or even sometimes females who cannot really reach those, those notes will have something comfortable to sing, but it's just sort of, a, sort of peculiar to gospel music, I think. I have my own take on it too as a tenor. First of all, I think that you're thinking it's high. It is, but the, the, what I want to say to you, it's in our break. The tenor voice is peculiar like unto the other voice types in that we are constantly having to mix our chest voice and our head voice. Whereas sopranos have a falsetta, so do the altos. And it's a matter of how high you want to take that chest up and how high you can take that chest voice up before you begin mixing the voice. And, if, and I'm hoping I'm making sense to you when I talk in these terms. Chest voice meaning that real strong guttural sound that you can make versus a mixture of the two. So in that, the tenor voice 
we're right there at that break where we have to decide how we're going to mix. And if we don't do it properly, we then begin to feel some vocal fatigue going on. The next thing is, is the tenor part to me is, I, I want to say energy, but it's the thrust. It kind of just enhances the other two parts. So when you get to the vamp part, generally who starts that off? It, the sopranos, and then you add the altos, and then to put the thing on it, you get all those tenor, ooh, ah. And so there is that energy behind that also that says, we need that power because already the Sopranos are up there in that area where they are using their mixed voice so it's loud. The altos say, hey, I'm not going to let the Sopranos outdo me. And so, hey, we're going to come with it too. Then the tenor and the baritone because there is not always a bass part. But like, well, we can't let the women outdo us. So here we go and go. And then for that soprano or alto that is versatile to say, hey, I can sing tenor, so I'll help your tenor section out. That's where we get the females in the tenor section to help. But my theory on that in having female sing tenor is every female tenor that I have encountered is a soprano. Masquerading as a soprano, a high soprano, because they don't use that falsetta. And so they're helping out their church choir, but you just want to be careful in that as well. Like I said, if it's in the throat, it's wrong. And you really want to investigate how you can sing and not feel that kind of weight and that pressure. That's healthy even in gospel singing because we want good singing in that genre as well. Great question. And, and to add to yes. what Lloyd said, I also think one of the problems is that especially in church choirs and things, things of that nature, a lot of times uh, males are forced to sing tenor when they're actually, they aren't tenors. Uh, so of course it's gonna be harder if, you, if you're more of a second tenor or if you're a baritone and if the, if the, if the notes are like, you know, G, you know, above middle C or A flat, that's gonna be hard for anybody but a first tenor. So a lot of times, for lack of, of the kind of male power that, that we need in a choir, we say, just sing tenor. So then you got people, you know, standing on their toes, trying to hit these songs, which, I mean, hit these notes, which really aren't in their vocal register. So you, you have that as well. Uh, yes. You talk about in terms of the music itself, or you talk about the business, or what do you? The growth. Well, I, you know, from when I started, it has grown tremendously. Uh, you know, when I started, you know, gospel music was considered uh, not really a, a, a authentic art form. It was just something that was sung in the churches. Uh, record companies basically didn't want to touch it unless they were uh, record companies set up exactly for gospel, like Savoy and some of the others. Um, of course, as time went on, record companies began to see the money that gospel music makes. And then you had a lot of, a lot of secular labels who began to say, oh, I'm going to form a secular, um, I'm going to form a gospel label under the, you know, the secular branch, and uh, we're going to jump in on this. And now, of course, they're spending money they're recording it better. I mean, you know, the live sessions in the very early, early gospel days sounded like you had a cassette player and you push record and you, were, you held it up in the back of the church. And that's what it sounded like. You know, you did your whole album in like a day or two. There was no uh, mixing or any of that, at least nothing that was elaborate. So the whole mindset has changed and I just, you know, and now that it's in movies, that it's in television, that it's in commercials, every type of media you see, it's there. I think that it, it's going to continue to grow. It's going to continue to reach even more people than before with computer and the internet radio and, and uh, iTunes and all of that. It's reaching markets that it's never reached before. So I, I just, I, you know, I can't really predict 
what's going to happen, but all I can really say is I can see it, I see it continually growing and growing and growing in a, in a positive way. Just to add to that, just this um, exercise here and your being here is acknowledgement of growth because the Kennedy Center is a cultural arts and they are recognizing that gospel music is a cultural art. And I think that uh, the, the programmers of this kind of thing deserve our applause and our yes. appreciation because that is a form of growth. <laughs> also in our um, educational systems, in our colleges and our universities, they are also providing courses in gospel music, the history of gospel music. As I taught at Oakwood University uh, for 10 years, I, the, the last couple of years I had music appreciation and because it was a historically black college, most of our students did not know the history of gospel music. So it was important because yes, we wanted them to know what a music major experiences by dr the drop needle test and you were turning on Tchaikovsky Symphony Number no. 5 and I need you to tell me that and what movement this is. Some of you may have remembered those drop needle tests or the Spring Song or Vivaldi's Four Seasons and all of that. But our young people did not know from whence they had come. So in that, courses are being designed that speak to this as well as organized gospel choirs that have directors that are also leading that in a healthy way. Music is being uh, written um, and scored. You can get Mr. Smallwood's octavos or scores in books so that you can actually teach them to your choir correctly as opposed to in the old day, you just keep playing or rewinding and, and you think that you hear this right. And I have been in workshop with Mr. Smallwood where he's like, no, that's not right. And you know, and I'm like, I thought it was this. I listened to that thing over and over. He's like, no, it should be this. And, and so that is another way and another form of growth. Well, it indeed has been wonderful to share and we could go on and on and on, you do know. And so I'm so glad we've had this time together as Carol Burnett would say. But before we go, I have been asked to lay hands on you, Brother Smallwood, uh, for a finale number. And if so inspired, I'm just gonna close while you kind of think, since I'm putting you on the spot here. Uh, Mr. J.J. Hairston uh, apologizes. That traffic did not uh, relieve so that he could get here. And so we apologize that he was not able to be with you, but we hope that this exercise has been informative, that you have a greater appreciation for gospel music, and obviously you do because you're here, but in your hearing it and also experiencing some of these things, that it has been enlightening and uh, refreshing. And so we thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. really caught me off guard just then. Um, okay. Um, when I've lost my direction, you're the compass for my way. You're the fire and lights when nights are long and cold. In sadness, you are the laughter that shatters all my fears. When I'm all alone, your hand is there to hold. Oh, Jesus, you're the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. 
You're the heart of my contentment, hope for all I do. Jesus, you are the center of my joy. Oh, Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Thank you. I am told that J.J. Hairston has arrived, and so we want you to just experience him and his artistry, and they're gonna come forward. Is there one other question? Thank you, Richard, for that. Jesus, the center of my joy. As they come forward, um, I encourage you to go and find records. Richard's got so many records that you can choose from, and all of them are good. So if you were to ask me which one is a good one, they all are. So. Uh, go support and and uh, with that as well as JJ Hairston has three to four recordings that I know of two of his choirs of his singers and so we want to be supportive of these artists as well um, as they render their ministry would you please give a hand for JJ Hairston and he will introduce Good to see you. Hello everyone, how are you? I'm so honored to be here today. I'm sorry I'm late, we were stuck in traffic. I just came all the way from Connecticut to be here today. We're excited about the opportunity. I'm honored to be on the stage with such great men um, and actually very humbled. Um, what we do is a little bit probably more, um, not only vocal, but uh, feet and hands and all that involved as well. We're very um, energetic, I should say. Um, but it's all a part of gospel music. I'm sure Lloyd and um, Richard were talking about how there are many forms of gospel music, um, but all of it is meant to touch the heart and the soul and the spirit and to make you feel what is being said, not just hear what's being said. Um, so what we do is probably um, <laughs> a little bit more uh, exciting. Not, not I don't want to say exciting because Richard Smallwood, what he does is such a classical, great presentation of gospel music. and, and He's, of course, been a great pioneer in gospel. What we do as a par probably a little younger um, is do all, a little bit, all the dancing and stuff as well. Uh, we do have singers that we're very proud of. As a matter of fact, um, I'm not sure, did you do the Amazing Grace presentation? Oh, you did. Okay. Too late. <laughs> oh, okay. I do have one of my singers here who I'm very proud of. Her name is Kenya Lee. And she is um, someone who um, sings with a lot of vocal depth. Um, when Richard and Lloyd and I were talking the other day, um, there are different styles. Of course, there's some styles which we do a lot of embellishment, I think the word was we use, where there's you know, what we call riffing. And I understand we hate that word, so we're not going to use it. <laughs> but a lot of embellishment. But then we have some singers who sing with a lot of vocal tone and depth, but still get the point across. Um, Kenya is one of those types of singers. I wanted to bring her forth just to sing a little bit of Amazing Grace. Is that okay? Great.
Thank you very much. We're very proud of Kenya. Again, there's one style of gospel, and I have other singers who we bring up, and they would do you know, a lot of riffing <laughs> or embellishment, but as you can see, there are some singers who can still make you feel the song without all the embellishment. So while it all is important, it's all just different styles, but it all is meant to touch the heart, the soul, and the spirit. We hope that you've enjoyed everything that happened today. We pray that you walk away with something that would make you further understand what gospel music is and how you can make it a part of your life. Thank you very much. This concludes our symposium. Would you give all of our artists an applause, please? And thank you for coming and have a good day. Thank mm -hmm. you.